Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Our Foundations podcast. My name is Joshua, your host, and today's episode will be focused on secular religion. So we've been talking about the views of the early church, and throughout this season, season three, doing a comparison of the early church and the early Christian movement to modern-day alternative movements and things like agorism, libertarianism, those types of movements that are going on in today's world. And we just wrapped up talking about Uh, discipleship and putting some things into action and building relationships, these types of things, mainly from the early church perspective. And then I also tied that in to the secular modern day perspective as well. And at this point, we are kind of tapering off towards the end of season three and wrapping up some of these topics and concepts. So As I do that, this last section is going to be about the kingdom of man versus the kingdom of God, the difference of how they act and what their beliefs are, what their morality is, all of these types of things. And part of that is secular religion. And what I want to do is look at secular religion, what that is, what some examples are, how that is applied in today's world, where that leads, where that is headed, where that has taken us uh, up until this point, and then compare that to the idea of the kingdom of God, the movement of the original church, as well as secular alternative movements in modern times, because it, it all ties together, where the Bible and the original Christians talked about this separation of the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God, of the world and the church, that it brings us into this idea of secular religion, how does the world act, what is the system of the world, all of these types of things, and how do we interact with it. And with that, as we look into that, we can see where the world is headed. We can see what the world has become, how those systems have evolved and are currently evolving. And that brings us into even the secular aspects of how to interact with these current modern day systems, because we do have this contrast between the idea of the world and the kingdom of God in this early church perspective, And that still exists to this day, and I am a big proponent of viewing things from that worldview and that perspective, but you also just have this issue of because the worldly systems are the way that they are, and because they are headed where they are headed towards things like totalitarianism, uh, technocracy, and things of this nature, more control, more manipulation, more things in those realms, because that is where things are and where they are headed, there is even this secular push, these secular motivations to get away from that, to step outside of that, to protect ourselves from that, that doesn't necessarily have to be a religious view. That doesn't have to be something with religious motives. It is so blatant and such an obvious issue, and it affects our lives so much that even in the secular world, this is something that is very important. Hence, the growth of things like libertarianism, agorism, anarchism, all of these different alternative movements, as well as the alternative systems like cryptocurrencies and homeschooling and homesteading, all of these have seen huge rises in interest and participation over the past, let's say, decade and definitely in the post-COVID world. And so that's what I want to focus on for this last bit of season three. And I say the last bit, it's probably not going to be over extremely soon, but we are in that tail end. So I'm just keeping you updated on the outline for where we are in the season, where we're headed. I used to update episodes back in season one, and I don't do those anymore. So I try to give brief updates, usually at the end, but sometimes at the beginning. I'll go ahead and give the update here since usually I do it at the end, but right now I'm doing it at the beginning. So I will go ahead and give the disclaimer that this podcast in its entirety is meant to be listened to in its entirety from start to finish in chronological order. The ideas build on themselves, and that is going to become more and more apparent in these next few episodes as we get into these specific secular religions. And I will say that I have covered these before. 
We have the examples of statism and the Church of Woke and scientism. I have done a whole episode on the religion of statism in the past. I have touched on the Church of Woke many times, especially during the uh, first Venermani interview and the elaboration episodes in between there. He kind of really fleshed out that idea a lot. And scientism, I haven't directly discussed, but we have indirectly talked about it and even directly talked about aspects of it. And so I am bringing in all of these things together and looking at them through the lens of these season three concepts and this perspective. And so we will be touching on them from a different angle. And I will also be assuming that you already know the things that I have covered in past episodes. So that is why I would definitely recommend that you have listened to the past episode so that you kind of get all this and you don't miss out from my lack of totally explaining every little thing all over again. Because for listeners that are keeping up, I don't want to do that to you. That's a waste of your time. And for those that are not caught up, I at least will give brief introductions to concepts and such. But in general, I will assume that you already know these things. If you don't know what technocracy is, then you're kind of way behind. If you're not very familiar with eugenics or the role that the state has played in eugenics and the role the state is playing in technocracy and all of these kinds of things, then you are behind and you need to go back and listen to those different topics in previous episodes. So to begin with, what I would like to do is just look at the idea of secular religion first as an introduction to these specific religions. So in general, there are religions in the kingdom of man that are not necessarily focused on a deity or an institutional religious order. As I've pointed out before, these would still be under the authority of the adversary, still a part of the kingdom of man from a Christian perspective, and uh, against God. Therefore, definitely against God, because who is whoever is not for me is against me, and whoever is not against me is for me. Uh, both of those have been said, the positive and the negative, uh, by Yeshua himself. So we can see that there are two mutually exclusive camps, the whole idea in the pattern of heaven and hell and that perspective of an afterlife is that you have divided people between two camps. They had their life to choose which camp they want to be a part of, and in the end, they are put into those two separate camps. They are mutually exclusive. And so from that perspective, the kingdom of man and secular religion fits within this idea of a secular religion that goes against the idea of God and the natural order. But I would say that this is not necessarily outwardly apparent. We can even see how most people involved in these religions don't even view it as a religion. They don't believe that it is a religion. They don't view what they do as religious acts. They don't assess their views and their belief systems, their morality as being a part of this religious structure. But as you will see, when we really look into these different religions, these secular religions, they are fulfilling that role of a religion. By definition, they are religions. And so we will get into that. But uh, that is an interesting aspect of this is that most people involved in secular religions don't view it as a religion. And so that creates some problems when you talk about a secular religion to people that don't believe there is such thing as a secular religion. And in some ways there is not. But uh, like I said, technically, from a biblical perspective, all of these secular religions are under the authority of the adversary. So I have talked about in previous episodes that that concept of there being powers and principalities that steer things behind the scenes that are overall in power and in authority over certain people, over certain regions, over certain aspects of the world. And I specifically read verses and the views of the early church on 
how the adversary is the one that is overall in charge of the kingdom of man. And I made that abundantly clear, I believe. And I think it was the last episode or the one before that. And so uh, that is something that I don't have to hash out all over again. But there is another aspect that is also interesting and unique and something that is not at first apparent. And that would be that many people that consider themselves Christians in the modern world can also be categorized under these secular religions. Now, you would think that that would be a contradiction, and personally, I believe that that is a contradiction, but it is true nonetheless. And as we get into these, I will point out how these things are manifesting themselves and how people fit into these categories. But the key for all of this is to outline what religion and worship are, and how the subject relates to the ideology, the subject being the worshiper, the uh, adherent to the religion. How does that person relate to the ideology, relate to that religion, relate to that set of beliefs? If their beliefs and actions line up on most accounts as religious beliefs and actions, then it can be confirmed that the person is participating in the secular religion. God and his natural order are identifiable and described both in scripture and in creation, as well as through revelation. And I have talked about these different aspects at the beginning of the season, but these are things that we can identify. We can describe them. We can figure out how they do manifest themselves in the current world. So we can see what the natural order is. If you have not listened to the natural order episodes, by the way, go back and do that. That is very crucial to this season, especially. But that has been done. I have done that as well as many, many others who are much wiser than I am. And so we can see what that is. Now, we need to identify what the other side is. So when an ideology or a belief system takes the role of God on itself and or defines morality and the natural order in a contrary manner to God's design, then that system is a different religion. So again, we can identify the natural order, and if we have an ideology or belief system that takes on the role of God and that defines the natural order as something different than what it apparently is, uh, we could also word this in a different way and say, something that says the dark side of the natural order is good and the light side of the natural order is evil, something that flips that, something that's an inversion, that is something that can be identified as a separate religion, something different than the natural order, something against God's design. And so that would be where we can identify a religion that is possibly a secular religion, or possibly just a different religion in the normal sense of the word religion, but it is something different than what the religions that are built under God's natural order are. And when it is not officially a religion per se, and does not outwardly appear to follow a deity or divinity, then it can be classified as a secular religion. And again, the examples that I have here are statism, the Church of Woke, and scientism. These are things that do not outwardly worship or follow a deity or any kind of divinity. They are not necessarily viewed as religions in and of themselves, but they do fill that role of a religion. They do define morality and ethics. They do define the natural order and define it in a different way than God defines it. And they fill all of these different boxes. And so, therefore, they can be easily classified as secular religions. And we can look at each one of these and understand what they are, how to identify them, who is a part of these different religions, what effect that has on the world, how the Christian should relate to them, how the secular alternative movements should relate to these people and these religions and all of these types of things. So that is the goal of the next few episodes. I'm going to start off this series with the religion of statism. Again, this is something that I have covered in the past. I did a whole episode on statism. I don't know which episode it is, so I'll try to put that in the show notes if I can remember to do so, but I'm sure you can easily search and figure that out. But 
what I want to do to begin with is start off with a quote, some definitions, some more quotes, and then get into some discussion about the religion of statism. I will start off with a quote from David Lipscomb from his book on civil government that I've quoted many times before and probably will quote again. Quote, It is clear that the influence upon man that arose from forming and conducting human governments was to wean man from the government of God, make him feel independent of that government and of his maker. It inspired his heart with the idea that man is more than a servant. He naturally magnifies his own works and his own institutions so that but few men give their time and service to the human government but that they soon come to think the human much more essential to the world's well-being than the divine government. The introduction of human additions into the divine institution has the same tendency. Men who introduce, operate, and support human additions to the government of God soon come to magnify these human additions, that they esteem them of more importance to the well-being of the servants of God than any of the God-ordained appointments of his institution. This is but the working of human nature. A proper understanding of these principles and manners of God's working among and dealings with the world is essential in any just understanding of the origin, mission, and destiny of human governments, their relation to God, and of the relation that the Christian and Church of God sustain to them. I will now give the definition for religion, or at least some definitions that I have found looking up what religion is, as is defined by the secular world. And religion is, possibly, a specific fundamental set of beliefs and practices generally agreed upon by a number of persons or sects. The body of persons adhering to a particular set of beliefs and practices. The practice of religious beliefs. Ritual observance of faith. Something one believes in and follows devoutly. A point or matter of ethics or conscience. A set of beliefs concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe, especially when considered as the creation of a superhuman agency or agencies, usually involving devotional and ritual observances and often containing a moral code governing the conduct of human affairs. So if you're paying attention here, pretty much all of those very clearly point to the idea of how a statist views the state. It is a superhuman agency that involves devotion and ritual observances, and it governs the conduct of human affairs, a pretty clear definition right here. And we have this fundamental set of beliefs and practices that are generally agreed upon by a number of persons or sects. And so you could say most people agree upon this set of beliefs and practices that we call statism, we call government. And we can go through that whole list of definitions, and they all do adhere very well to this concept of statism as a religion. So the next definition will be worship. Worship is defined as such, to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion, to perform or take part in worship or an act of worship a form of religious practice with its creed and ritual. So can you think of any creeds or rituals involved with the state or performing of any kind of act of worship in regards to the state? Or uh, maybe some people might regard the state with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. Uh, this, this just might describe some status. And so if we can fit statism within the definition very clearly of religion, and very clearly we can fit the act of statists and how they interact with the state within the definition of worship, then I think it's pretty easy to say that statism is, in fact, a secular religion. Now, I have three more quotes to get to, and I'll start off with the first that is from Karl Popper on The Open Society and Its Enemies 2. And he is referring to the philosophy of Frederick Hegel, and it goes as such. Quote, 
the state is the divine idea as it exists on earth. We must therefore worship the state as the manifestation of the divine on earth. The state is the march of God through the world. The state must be comprehended as an organism. To the complete state belongs, essentially, consciousness and thought. The state knows what it wills. The state exists for its own sake. The state is the actually existing, realized moral life. And so that is coming from, again, the philosophy of Hegel, and he is commenting on that in this book. The next two quotes come, well, I guess I should mention here that um, this is the extreme. This is what many statists do believe deep down and what their actions show, but they don't even admit this to themselves. So they do believe that the state in its existence is realized moral life, that the state defines morality, that laws should reflect and should define morality. If you break the law, that is bad. If you follow the law, you are doing good. The state is the one in charge of that. And there are different degrees of this, and many people have multiple allegiances in regards to what they believe is right and wrong and where morality comes from. But the other aspects here, we have this idea that the state can be comprehended as an organism and that you can almost give it this aspect of consciousness or thought when you're thinking of what the state is, what the government is. A lot of times people refer to the government and say that the government uh, did X, Y, Z, the government, blah, 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 the state does this and that. And I refer to it in the same way, because in a way, I agree that the state uh, can be defined as such, and it is a good way of describing the state. But When you view it from this perspective of statism as a religion, and the state is an entity that you can describe as such, and as we learned in previous episodes, that the kingdom of man, the governments of man, the state, ultimately is ruled over by the authority of the adversary, then uh, that becomes a little iffy, especially for Christians. When you look at the state from that perspective and then you realize, you pull the veil back and see who is that entity behind the state. And that is not necessarily a good thing. You also have this concept that was brought up at the beginning of this excerpt here that the state is the divine idea as it exists on earth. And so, therefore, worship the state as the manifestation of the divine on earth. And so, it's this idea, it's playing off this uh, aspect of the natural order. You have this principle of hierarchy. And so I've talked about this before, but hierarchy is a principle of the natural order, and it is even on the light side of the natural order. But proper hierarchy does not involve man ruling over other men. That is not proper hierarchy. That is not the proper meaning of hierarchy. Meaning being another principle of the natural order, and meaning is defined. And so if we know that the purpose, the meaning of hierarchy is that you have the divine, and under the divine is humanity, and other under humanity is the created world. You have nature, you have the animal kingdom, and under that would be the other aspects of the created world, and we have this hierarchy we can clearly see. Within humanity, we also see hierarchy in the form of the family and in the form of the church. However, when, at least when we look from a biblical perspective, when that hierarchy is, if, when there is an attempt to manifest that hierarchy in the form of having a man ruling over other men, placing a king above a nation and forming a formalized government, God defines this as a rejection of himself. It is a rejection of his role as the head of the hierarchy. Above humanity is only God, and that is it. Within the family, you could say that you have this hierarchy of parents being over their children. The main reason is because the children are not able, they're not mature enough, they're not responsible enough, they're not even physically able oftentimes to take care of themselves, and so that is the role of the parent to take care of the child, and the parent is above the child in that regard as the parent protects the child, raises the child, teaches the child, 
all of these types of things. And that role starts to fade. That hierarchy, in a sense, starts to fade as the child matures and grows up into a fully independent human being with their own life. And so there is still respect that the parent will always get from the child, or the child should always give to the parent. But this role of hierarchy within the family unit stems from that aspect. And to say that one person should rule over all other people or a group of people, that is to say that those people are not inherently able, they're not responsible enough, they are not mature enough, they may not be physically able to conduct their own affairs, and therefore another person needs to be in charge of those people, or a small group of elite people should be in charge of the masses. And that's not the way God defines things. God says that he is the one that is over humanity. And every individual has the responsibility to run their own lives and to run their families. And when there is a deficiency there, that is where the family unit steps in for those in the extended family and the community who are in need. And if there is a bigger need, and oftentimes if there is a need that is not conveniently met by the family, that is the role of the church to fill that need. There is already a way that these needs and principles are to be met, and that is clearly defined. So that is how the hierarchy within the light side of the natural order is supposed to be manifested. When you have a government and that is men ruling over other men, that is a perversion of this right version of hierarchy, this this way, this ideal of how hierarchy should manifest itself within humanity. And so, uh, obviously, when you get into the next part of the quote about how we should worship the state because it's a manifestation of the divine on earth, this is a perversion because it is true that the state, the government, mimics the role of God and the divine. It mimics that hierarchy. But that is why, that is exactly why it is a perversion and it is evil, because the state is taking the role of God. The state is inserting itself into that role and position and receiving worship for being in that position. And that is evil. That is a perversion of the proper hierarchy. A human being should not be in that role. Multiple human beings should not be in that role. A human institution should not be in that role. Only the divine and what is set up by the divine is what should be in that role. And so that is why the aspect of the state being considered divine and being worshipped and the rise of the state being uh, viewed as, quote, the march of God through the world. Um, that's, uh, that's ridiculous. And that is a perversion of the natural order. And th that is another example of how statism is a religion because it is taking over this role of hierarchy that the divine has over humanity. This is a religious idea because we're talking about the divine. And when a secular institution takes over all of these ideas and these roles, then it is taking over this aspect of being a religion. The next two quotes both come from Larkin Rose and both come out of his book, The Most Dangerous Superstition. Quote, in truth, the belief in government is a religion made up of a set of dogmatic teachings, irrational doctrines which fly in the face of both evidence and logic, and which are methodically memorized and repeated by the faithful. Like other religions, the gospel of government describes a superhuman, supernatural entity above mere mortals, which issues commandments to the peasantry for whom unquestioning obedience is a moral imperative. The next quote is brief, quote, The belief in government is not based on reason, it is based on faith. So again, that comes from Larkin Rose as he sums up everything that I just said, pretty much. The final quote for a little while will come from H.G. Wells from his book, The Open Conspiracy. And I have quoted him many times before, especially in the series on corruption and conspiracy. Highly recommended if you have not listened to that one. But this quote goes like this, quote, 
The open conspiracy as consisting of a great multitude and variety of overlapping groups, but now all organized for collective political, social, and educational, as well as propagandist action. They will recognize each other much more clearly than they did at first, and they will have acquired a common name. The character of the open conspiracy will now be plainly displayed. It will have become a great world movement, as widespread and evident as socialism and communism. It will largely have taken the place of these movements. It will be more. It will be a world religion. This large, loose, assimilatory mass of groups and societies will be definitively and obviously attempting to swallow up the entire population of the world and become the new human community. I think H.G. Wells sums that up very well there, and The Open Conspiracy is not a sci-fi fiction book, by the way. A... H.G. Wells is tied in a lot with the eugenics movement and the Rhodes Roundtable groups and those types of things, if you are not aware. So he definitely touches on the kind of whole point of these sections here that I am getting into, that there are multiple movements and groups. They are political, they are social, they are educational, they are based on propaganda, it's the media, it's all of these different things that are coming together for a common purpose to create a new human community and to swallow up the entire population of the world. And this movement as a whole is like a world religion. Now, I would say that it's not quite a world religion yet. However, when you look at what's behind the scenes, the spiritual aspects of influence, if it is all being influenced and the dominion is being held by one entity or one spiritual power or one spiritual group, then I guess you could say that it is one religion. But I am breaking it up into a few of these most prominent groups that exist, and that would be statism, the Church of Woke, as well as scientism. And that's where I am focusing. Now, you will notice that he said it will be like the movements of socialism and communism. Those were pretty big movements. Uh, Next to capitalism, they're probably the largest movements in modern history. And most would argue that what we call capitalism today is much more in line with socialism than free market capitalism as the early Enlightenment thinkers and the founding fathers and those types of people thought of free market capitalism. This is very different. We live in a more socialist world. But this new movement will take over all of that. And if you remember back to the Ven Armani episodes or some of those that became before and some that came after, I talked a lot about this difference between a materialistic mindset and a more immaterial mindset. Uh, Vin Armani talks about the mystical or the magical, and I used that example of a rhizomatic approach versus an arborescent approach. And so if you think about that, you can see how H.G. Wells is thinking a very similar thing, and he's just describing it differently. Same as Sorokin, same as many other people that I have discussed before. But he says this large, loose, assimilatory mass of groups and societies. He's making it clear that this isn't just one group or one movement that's going to swallow everything up. It's not one materialistic institution. That's not what this is. This is something different. And that is what we are trying to describe. That's also why it is harder to describe. But as we are talking about in this current episode, we're talking about statism. And statism is the most material of the three secular religions that I am covering in this series. And so statism is what will give these others, as well as some that I am not covering, it's what gives them substance. It's what uh, manifests them in the world in an institutional way, a structured way, an ordered way. So this is kind of the key foundation for this movement that will swallow up the entire population of the world. It's this religion of statism, but it is not something that is country-specific or politician-specific. Again, this is moving to a more worldwide movement, as I talked about many times before and H.G. Wells mentions here. Now, overall, 
we as a society have come to a place where the state is now in the place of God in many respects. You have citizens that look to the state to provide for their needs. They look to the state to protect them, to teach them, to teach their children, to raise their children, to legislate morality, punish others, provide for those in needs, regulate transactions, manage societal interaction, and on and on. These are the things that are supposed to fall under the dominion of God. God has directed us how to handle these matters, both practically and conceptually, both as a society and as individuals. The Christian is to look to God for guidance and assistance in all matters. This is not the role of the state. Many have faith in and rely on government departments, programs, and laws to solve society's problems instead of the kingdom of God's church of believers, their programs, and individual action. Unfortunately, even most believers have rejected God's role and teachings, at least in these matters. Most people are looking to the state to provide for them and to fill all of these needs in society, to fill this role. And that is not the state's job, at least from a Christian perspective. I'll read a few verses that I've read many times before, but these would have been extremely familiar to the original Christians to the early church. This would be 1 Samuel chapter 8, starting in verse 7. The Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done, from the day I brought them out of Egypt up into this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So again, God is saying that they are rejecting him when they want a king, when they want to set up a formal government with humans at the head of that, that is a rejection of God in his ways. Not only that, but Samuel was told to solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. And there is a description of that, talking about things like sending your children to war to die for them and to serve them as slaves and to take your possessions and your money through taxation and things like this. It's not a pretty picture. It is exactly the way things played out, both for them and for us. As we get back to the secular religion aspect, citizens sing songs to and in reverence of the state. They go through rituals and motions to honor and obey the state, lifting their hands and removing their hats in respect. They place the state in a position above everyone else with more power, more rights, more knowledge, and more respect than mere humans. The state is omniscient, with the goal of doing what's best for everyone, prioritizing its own citizens and working all things out for the good of those who love it. They have created this ruling entity to be lord over all. There is a priestly class of politicians that perform the duties required of the state after being confirmed into the, quote, faith through specific rituals and acceptance by the overarching body. They go through various rituals and rites to receive their positions, to enact policy, and to make decisions. The common man gives homage and support to the state through song, salute, voting, contributions, and various other things. If a citizen wants something of the state, they vote and or seek the priestly class for aid, such as praying. Citizens give up portions of their time, their money, and their natural rights in exchange for the benefit of the state and the state taking care of the management of society. So this should sound familiar. People, uh, Christians, uh, people that are a part of any religion are sacrificing their time, their money, some of their rights. They sacrifice that for the sake of their God or their religion. And in exchange, their religion promises them something or their God gives them some benefit in return and overall is taking care of that whole society of worshipers. The early church seems to have seen this as a corruption of the kingdom of God and God's rule over man. 
and God's role of ruling over man. So as believers, they were to voluntarily give to charity and to the church in the form of tithes and offerings and sacrifices of time and materials and all of that kind of stuff. Now, This was not under the threat of force and extortion, as with the funding of the welfare state. The church was to handle and distribute funds and resources with care, oversight, and wisdom. There is a lot of discussion about this in multiple places in the New Testament about how to handle some of these things. The state, however, is well known for its corruption, inefficiency, corporatism, waste, everything else. Our king is constant and unchanging, whereas the leaders of the state change in person and policy quite frequently. In God's kingdom, the minority have the same rights as the majority, whereas the kingdom of man gives the majority precedent over the minority. At times, the state takes the opposite extreme and gives an elite minority rulership over the majority. The state or the earthly king, ruler, emperor, whoever, they say that they are the source of law, rights, and morality, and that they have the authority to enforce and punish based on these proclamations. It determines what is right and wrong for a society based on the opinions of men. Now, the early church saw this as a corruption of the truth. They believed that God was the source of law, rights, and morality, as well as everything else in our world, physical and conceptual, material and immaterial. It is all based in him, and only he has the right to rule. When people sin, it is a sin against God first and man second. Even if our action is against another person, the action is primarily against God's law of love. There are also sins that are only against God, with no direct human victim, so to say. The state perverts this as well by claiming that there are crimes against the state, and illegal activity is first against the state by breaking the law and second the victim. There are also crimes that are solely against the state with no human victim at all. These actually currently make up a large portion of the incarcerations around the world. Now, if those two things sound very familiar, how the early Christians treated God and his role, and how the state treats the citizens, it's because they are the same thing, because one is just a perversion of the other. It's copying the same system. They are both religions. That is the point. Statism isn't just like a religion. It is a religion. Statism is the religion, and the state is their god. Politicians are the priests. The bureaucracy is the institutional high hierarchical church, patriotic citizens make up the church body, and all is based on their religious text, the founding governing documents. In America, this would be the Constitution. It defines morality, what people should and shouldn't do, the scope of punishments, the limits of free will, the boundaries of the use of force, how the priestly class operates, how the citizens are to operate, what rights the individuals have, is surrounded by the mythology of the patriarchs, the founding fathers in America. And it all came out of a national birth through war, defending from the evils of others, out of liberation from an oppressive nation, etc. Even in this secular religion, there have been disagreements within the religion that have caused splits, mainly stemming from differing interpretations of the text and how to apply it in modern times. Like the Reformation, this has led to multiple denominations, multiple political parties, and different leanings of followers. Some follow this doctrine, some another. They all still believe in the state, in the religion of statism, though, and the god of the state, just with different views of what that god is really like, what the intended meanings of its texts were, and how us humans, under its rule, should act. Just as atheists were very uncommon and often shunned from polite society in the time of the Reformation, anarchists and hardcore libertarians and people of this nature are playing the role of the non-religious today. They do not subscribe to this idea of the state, and so they are the heretics. While Christians should never be a part of the religion of statism, we aren't anarchists or libertarians in the pure sense either, because we don't truly believe in having no ruler. 
Instead, we believe in having no king but Christ, that God should be the only rightful ruler of humanity. Basically, Christians, the early church included, believe... uh, let, Let me rephrase that. The majority of the founding fathers of the church, the original Christians in their writings, they do make it clear that they believe that God is the one who should rule over mankind, that that is not man's rule, and they do not appeal to the state. In fact, they actually recommend not to have anything to do with the state, and that a true Christian would not be in a position of being a magistrate and other examples that I will get to in a later episode where I go into the specific quotes of the early Christians and the church fathers. But that was their view, that it wasn't necessarily that there should be no ruler, it's just that there should be no human ruler, that the only stretch to having a human ruler would be Yeshua, would be Christ, the Messiah, because he was both human and divine by their reckoning. I've got two more more final quotes from Larkin Rose from his book, The Iron Web, and I'll do those and then start wrapping this up. The first one is, quote, you are not Christians, you are not Jews, you are not Muslims, and you certainly aren't atheists. You all have the same God, and its name is government. You're all members of the most evil, insane, destructive cult in history. If there was ever a devil, the state is it, and you worship it with all your heart and soul. Next quote, Some of us realize the self-evident truth that no election, no constitution, no legislation, and no other pseudo-religious political ritual can bestow upon anyone the right to rule another. Nothing can make a man into a rightful master. Nothing can make a man into a rightful slave. Now, like much of this series, I am weaving in both the secular and the Christian because I'm using this parallel of the early Christian church, but I am also applying that to secular beliefs and alternative movements. So Larkin Rose would be a secular source, and obviously the Christian references are religious sources. But the whole point from both sides is kind of my whole point from both sides is that this is a religion, statism. There are secular religions, and from either way you look at it, whether a religious perspective, a spiritual perspective, or just a materialistic perspective or a secular perspective, you can still clearly see that this is a religion. And many people much smarter than me have seen this throughout the years. And so I'm trying to point that out. And then the obvious comparison between statism and Christianity makes it just even more clear. If it's mimicking a religion this much, it's really hard to say, oh, that's not a religion, if it fits every definition and mimics Christianity to a T, except for the fact that it's a perversion and corruption of the actual ideals behind the religion of Christianity. But I guess that's just kind of a side story. So, Basically, the way that the early church viewed things was that all things come from God, including political systems. The problem is that the current dominant flavors of political systems, as well as the dominant political systems of the time of the early church, neither one are representative of God's system, but rather they're a bastardization of his creation. If God wants humans to work together, to be organized, to order their societies, and to take care of one another, modern political approaches do this with a state through force and coercion instead of God's way of having a group of believers serving one another according to his principles under God's leadership. Men want to have some... humans ruling over other humans. God lays claim to be the only one with the right to rule. There is always this dichotomy between the ways of the kingdom of man and those of the kingdom of God. Again, that's part of what makes it so easy to see that statism is clearly a religion and clearly one that is separate, apart, and opposed to Christianity. As a bit of a side note, we could also look at the other half of the state, uh, the other half being one half is political and one half is corporate, and maybe not necessarily half, but I surely you can get the point here. But the corporate part definitely deserves mention as well. You can't exclude corporations from 
all of this talk as well. In today's world, there is often little separation between the corporate world and the state. The word corporation in a biblical context refers to the corporate body of believers. It is an institution that never dies, regardless of how many members die. The church is its own entity. It's an immortal creation of God that reproduces through his spirit and the works of the saints and the believers. A modern business corporation has the same qualities, but with the goals of profits and power. It reproduces through success in these worldly ends and the works of those dedicated to worldly success, a corruption of the corporate church. The qualities of immortality and creation from nothing should only exist through God, but we see them in institutional government, fiat money, corporations, and other institutions of the kingdom of man. As with much of creation, God made the original form or concept, and man corrupted it. That would be the overall stance. Now, again, I'm not getting into the aspect of corporatism and all that kind of stuff. That can be reserved for another time. But I'm just saying that when you look at even things associated with the state that are kind of behind the scenes when you get into this institution of the church of statism, so to say you do see these same things playing out, these same parallels, these same patterns, these same religious distinctions and descriptions. They all fit because there is such thing as a secular religion, if you hadn't figured that out yet. So that is all I am going to cover in today's episode. I will get back into this series of secular religion next time. I believe next episode will be on the Church of Woke. Now again, I have covered the Church of Woke many times before, but I will cover it again and probably from a slightly different angle within the context of what we're talking about. At least that would be my goal. And so that's the plan for what we will be discussing next week. And I will continue on and this will be a whole series on secular religion as a whole. Now, I would like to say thank you for everyone listening, just in general, for being listeners. Thank you for all of your support, whether it be through ratings or reviews or financially through Patreon or Subscribestar. Thank you for all of it. I really do appreciate it. And please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or comments or recommendations or requests, anything like that reach out to me, our foundations at protonmail.com. As I've stated a few times before, if you are interested specifically in this content for season three, then you'd probably be interested in one of the few perks, I must admit, of being a financial supporter. I am releasing a book that I am writing in small sections on those platforms as I get around to it kind of randomly. But uh, as it comes out, you will basically end up getting the book for free over time as I'm writing it. So there might be some changes and revisions and stuff and things of that nature. But if you're interested in this con- this content and specifically having this religious overtone and that type of thing, then you would probably be really interested in that. Now, I don't give a lot of perks for people that support the podcast financially because I spend most of my extra time that I have for this on just generating the podcast and recording it and editing it and doing all the different things. So um, I don't really have a lot of extra time to put towards doing extra things on top of that. But I have in the past done some exclusive episodes. I have done some early releases. I've done some other things like that. When I've had a guest that I knew was coming on, then sometimes I would take questions from supporters like uh, Vin Armani, I did that with him. And when he came on for a follow-up episode, I gave that opportunity as well for anyone that saw it at least. And so I I do try to give some perks, but overall, uh, I think it's just mainly if you think that this content for this show should be out there for free to everyone and you want to help financially support it so that that can be possible now and in the future, then I would greatly appreciate you coming alongside me and doing that. So that is everything. I hope you have enjoyed this episode and come back next week. I'm out. Peace. This has been our Foundations Podcast. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. (laughs) Bye-bye.